Welcome into the Paul Kuharski Podcast, part of 440 Sports. I'm Paul Kuharski of paulkuharski.com, and I've hit my name three times, fulfilling my contractual obligation to myself. Welcome in. We're going to talk about how the cuts that the Titans executed on Wednesday are really not that painful. Um, the odds that one of these guys that they've sent packing perform elsewhere in a way that hurts the Titans. And we'll do that in the context of uh, how these things have come around in the history of the team, the recent history. Uh, we'll take a look at free agent edge options for this team, touching on what Mike Herndon wrote for the site earlier this week. Um, I have been to virtually every major city in America and that did not change with my visit to Tulsa, Oklahoma earlier this week. And I'll pay a bit of a tribute to Taylor Lawan. So that's what's coming. Here we go to uh, Wednesday's quote unquote shakeup. Um, I fear, not that I care, but nationally, this is going to be taken as some kind of big shakeup by the Titans. It is not a big shakeup by the Titans. Um, Taylor Lewan, as much as I love him, and we'll get to that, he'd missed 34 of the last 66 games that the Titans have played. That is not a good hit rate. You know it if you follow this team. Robert Woods, in his one year here, coming off an ACL injury, made far too much money. He might have led the team in receptions, but he got a measly 9.9 .9 yards per catch and he had two touchdowns. Uh, Zach Cunningham had an elbow injury uh, that turned into a big deal this season. He played in six games. We'll circle back to all of these guys. Randy Bullock uh, does not hit deep field goals. They don't even really try deep field goals with him as their kicker. These four moves combined saved $37.9 million of salary cap money per SPO track and give the Titans now $11.3 million of space. Could be more to come, but right now they've gone from very bad shape to very um, satisfactory shape. So uh, we knew most of this is coming. We've been talking about it for some time. Let's talk a bit about each of these guys. Luan <clears throat> just hasn't been the same the last four years. Hurt, primarily the knee, tore an ACL two years ago, um, and then uh, came back. I think it was six games into that season. Titans survived it well. Ty, Ty Sambrilo and David Quessenberry um, both played well enough at left tackle to help Derrick Henry still get over 2,000 yards to keep Ryan Tannehill upright and, and for the team to, to – uh, to do pretty well, considering it was ultimately down to its third left tackle. That's not how it played out in 2022, where Lawan <clears throat> re-injured that ACL, in part, reports said, because the surgery on the initial repair wasn't uh, tidy enough, shall we say. Um, and so Lawan lost after two games um, this most recent season, Titans in far less good shape to replace him with Dennis Daly, who John Robinson had signed to be the, the third offensive tackle. We all know that he was probably the worst player on the team in terms of guys that got any sort of regular playing time, and it absolutely killed them. <clears throat> the door is open. The Titans are not closing the door on the idea of maybe bringing Luan back but I would guard against any huge optimism on this. I think they're going to go and do what they can to rebuild this line and get everything they need. It would leave the door a sliver open that if they're unsatisfied with what they've done after free agency, after the draft, after assessing what's still out there on the market, after all of that, if Luan's still out there and they feel like, hey, they could, could use depth at tackle, then maybe they'd investigate how little he'd play for, what condition his knee is in, and how they feel that dynamic of him in the locker room as an outspoken guy who's been, you know, a three-time Pro Bowler would feel about being 
in likely a swing tackle role with a kid in front of him. And even then, it would be difficult, I think, to have him in a role there where you're counting on him for something, even a third tackle role where you don't know if he's called on if that knee is going to hold up. And if you get in a situation where your starting left tackle goes down or your right tackle, you call on the one and that knee's an issue again, then you're to your fourth tackle. So I think it's a, somebody asked me for a percentage on it on Twitter. I said a 6% chance. I would put it out of mind um, and, and think that it's only uh, an emergency plan for them if they really struggle to build the offensive line depth, the tackle depth that they need. Robert Woods, um, <clears throat> you know, had no speed, no explosion, and no ability to separate. It's not the same guy that we saw have some success with the Rams. This ACL and age catching up to him at the same time. Maybe he reemerges uh, in the 2023 season for somebody that's got patience with him and can have patience with him in a way the Titans certainly couldn't have in a second year with a bloated contract. Um, but he, he really offered very little. And then the gall of the guy, he tweets um, after this happens that he's free. He's free. Well, who's free here? If he could have broken free of a defender, the, the Titans might have had some, you know, semblance of interest in keeping him. He's free. They're free. He wasn't free at all. He's quite expensive. So, uh, you know, guy handled himself like a pro all year. I don't think he complained about his targets and he shouldn't have because uh, how could you target the guy based on his inability to get open? But to tweet free like he was in prison, he put the Titans in prison with their passing game. He was a big reason they couldn't throw because their number two receiver, who wound up being their number one receiver when Traylon Burks was out, couldn't get open. So I, I, I wouldn't take that very well if I was the Titans at all, him tweeting that he was free. Zach Cunningham, as I said, played in six games. Turned out to have been a mistake to have signed him to the deal that they did. But the fact of the matter is um, when he was out of the lineup, the Titans were just fine. When he was out of the lineup, um, the Titans got better play most of the time from Dylan Cole. Um, and you can't pay um, a downhill run stopping two down, one and a half down linebacker the way that they paid Cunningham. The guy to pay is the guy who's like David Long, who I think they're going to have trouble paying because of his injury history. But the guy who's an all-over-the-field uh, player who can move backwards and uh, help you in coverage because that's the way the game goes now. Now, you got to be able to come forward and help as in, in, in the run game too. But you need to be able to help cover um, a tight end or even a big re receiver. And Zach Cunningham's not doing any of that. Neither is Dylan Cole or Jack Gibbons. But given the narrow role of that second inside linebacker position, sometimes it's the only inside linebacker and an and a extra defensive back is playing that other spot that I'm talking about. Um, hey, you know, bring on Dylan Cole, bring on Jack Gibbons, bring on the way the Titans schemed for those guys. Zach Cunningham, not worth it at all. Randy Bullock, John Robinson uh, had far too little concern through much of his term with the field goal kicker. Um, and Randy Bullock was an extension of that. Um, what was it? 47 or 48 to beat the Giants. The Titans merely lined him up with his preferred hash mark and didn't try to get any extra yards and he missed. That was a game winning field goal. Uh, they could have used that win. They could use any win. He tried six field goals from 47 yards or longer, which are pretty standard in today's NFL. That is not asking a lot. He was three for six um, on those field goals. And the Titans didn't try a lot of field goals that other teams would try, or they weren't comfortable just getting themselves in that area. They needed to get themselves closer. Um, so I would think Caleb Shudek is, is in the mix there. He's got a better leg. Um, he spent a great deal of the season on, 
injured reserve or PUP. Um, he's he's got a better leg. Uh, you know, you don't know about the mental until the guy has a lot of chances. But the Titans need to be able to kick a 50, a 53 yard field goal with some regularity and even take a crack at a, you know, 56 yard at the end of a half, at the end of a game, if, if that's all they can get. Um, so Bud Dupree is a, is a guy that many of us expected could be on this list. It still could come. It could be a reason it didn't happen with these others. Couldn't get in touch with him. Couldn't get in touch with his agent, whatever. They could, you know, wait uh, and see based on their planning if if they uh, need the room. If they did it now, they'd save $9.35 million um, and they'd eat $10.85 million. They can designate him as a June 1st cut. You don't have to wait until June 1st to do it. You can designate him early. I don't know if you could designate him. I'm working on finding this out. If you could designate him before the beginning of the new league year, which is March 15th um, with Julio Jones last year, um, they did it on March 16th, which sounds like it was right at the beginning of the new league year. If they designated him as a post June 1st cut, they would save 15.75 million. So, uh, you know, um, Six million more plus, they'd eat only four point five million dollars of dead money this year, and they would push six point four million dollars into next year. But they don't get that savings until June first rolls around. So they could do him a solid if they're making this move, designate him a June first cap cut, put him out into the market so he could go find work. But then the mechanism that frees up the money doesn't in fact happen until June 1st. You might remember that they were waiting on Julio Jones's money to free up when they did this with him. So the question is, any of these guys going to come back to bite the Titans? And my answer is I, I can't envision it. You know, who's got the best chance? Dupree, if he gets cut, if he gets healthy and he gets a, a cheap deal somewhere incentive laden, when he was good, he was he was pretty good for the Titans. Uh, he joined a good pass rush, and he had the same thing when he was with the Steelers, where he was part of a good pass rush, and he, he could be awfully effective as part of a good pass rush. So that's the guy I think you could see the most out of. I, I think that uh, Woods is washed. I think Lawan <clears throat> is going to have a hard time going and playing somewhere else. I don't know how much the fire burns for him. He'd have to put on some weight. He'd have to leave a town where he's got the uh, wife and kids and has raised them and the bussing with the boys, um, which is a, a nice second career for him. Um, but, I, you know, if he dedicated himself to doing that, he could go conceivably play. And, and the knee's tight and good. He could conceivably play some good uh, left tackle still for somebody. Uh, but probably not for a deal that the Titans could have gotten. I'm not worried about Zach Cunningham or Robert Woods one bit. But that did prompt me to say, hey, let's go back and look. Because as many things as the Titans do poorly, they've got a long track record, I think, of picking the right time to let people move on um, and to not re-sign guys and to not <clears throat> spend money to re-sign guys. Or, uh, or to let them go. I didn't pick out salary cap casualties in particular, but I just went through um, really the John Robinson regime. So starting in 2016, who did they let go? Who's done better in his next stop, better or as well <clears throat> as he did with the Titans. So we'll kind of work um, chronologically from most recent backwards. A.J. Brown had more yards last year than all the Titans wide receivers combined. Uh, he's certainly on track. <laughs> last year he did just fine. So he's on track to do <clears throat> just as well with the Eagles, if not better, played in the Super Bowl than he did with the Titans. And we all know that that trade doesn't look good. Roger Saffold's price came way down for Buffalo, and he had a solid season for the Bills. I was surprised to see that he uh, even got into the Pro Bowl activities, and he gave them a full 16 games. So I'd put him in the did-just-as-well column. Though 
I don't think it was unreasonable to let him go based on what he was scheduled to make and the shoulder issues that he was having. Rashawn Evans got 1.75 million, played 17 games, played a lot of snaps in Atlanta, but um, no issue whatsoever with letting him go. Jayon Brown got uh, just over a million dollars, played eight games for the Raiders. No issue with letting him go. Uh, letting him go, meaning let him go sign elsewhere after his contract expired. Four from the 2017 draft. Corey Davis is about to be cut after two years and $27 million with the Jets. He played 22 of 34 games, so continued to miss games. That's a dozen. 66 catches for 1,028 yards and six touchdowns. That's what you would want from him in one season, not in two seasons. So uh, as I said at the time, no beef with letting Corey Davis walk, despite the fact that the Titans could use a receiver like Corey Davis. For the money he got, two years, $27 million guaranteed, expecting to be cut now. Uh, no brain not to, to, to have paid him that. Adore Jackson, the guy that Titans changed their mind on, they had given him their fifth-year option. In the last year where you could withdraw the fifth-year option, they withdrew the fifth-year option. Um, he's missed 11 games in two years. Uh, he played some good football this year, 43rd in pro football focuses coverage grades, a 71. Um better than any Titan, Elijah Molden, who did not play a lot this year, was the 72nd rated coverage corner to Adoy Jackson's 43rd. Um, so, you know, but Adoy Jackson really petered out here and kind of seemed to give up at the end of his Titans thing. So I didn't have a huge uh, beef with that at all. There's two unreliable guys. Johnu Smith, clearly a product of the Titans system and what he was able to do here. He got four years, 41 and a quarter million dollars from the Patriots. Four years, $41.25 million guaranteed. He's got 55 catches through two years of this, 55 catches, 539 yards, and one touchdown. Product of the system in Tennessee, no complaints whatsoever about the Titans not paying him that. They didn't do a good job of replacing him. The first year thinking that Anthony Ferkser was going to be sufficient was ridic ridiculous. Jack Conklin, we've covered a lot. I personally didn't hold John Robinson to account on that, not, not going forward with his option. Um, he had been hurt. You didn't know exactly what you had. You were paying Lawan a lot of money on the other side. The problem with Conklin was their inability to replace him, starting with Isaiah Wilson um, and then Dylan Radins. And, uh, you know, now they've got Nicholas Petit Frere. Hopefully he grows into it. Excellent player. He was an all pro in Nashville, he was an all pro in Cleveland. He's missed 10 games in three years there. Four years, $60 million, 28.85 guaranteed. Four years, $60 million. doesn't sound that, that big now. But then uh, it sounded enormous. Um, and then I, I put together kind of a secondary list. Um, you go back to 2016. This is just when uh, Robinson was coming in. Zach Brown. Uh, left. He was not a good player in Tennessee, a second round inside linebacker, but he went to Buffalo and he had a pro bowl season. Then he had two solid years in Washington, one six game season in Philadelphia, definitely played better after he left here. Uh, Michael Griffin was on his way out then as well. 2017 to let chance Warmack go. Kendall Wright went to Chicago for a little bit. 2018, um, they moved on from DeMarco Murray. Avery Williamson got a big contract to go to the Jets. He circled back here for two games in 2021. 2019, Derek Morgan and Brian Arakpo uh, both retired. 2020 was the end of Marcus Mariota. Hasn't done better since he left. Jarrell Casey, people freaked out about that trade. 
Titans actually did him a favor by locking in the salary that he was due uh, with the Broncos rather than cutting him. Uh, huge noise about that. He got hurt that year, and the, the Titans had Jeffrey Simmons incoming. Logan Ryan uh, did okay with the Giants for a couple of years, but I don't think he played as well as he played with the Titans or the Patriots. Ryan Suckup did uh, slightly better. He's still with Tampa, I think, but in the three years he was there, he's 1.2% better on field goals and won a Super Bowl. So score him up there. Dennis Kelly in 2021, huge noise about letting him go. Only seven starts in Green Bay and Indianapolis. Did not play better. Did not play after leaving Tennessee. Huge noise about that. Again, Titans failed to replace him sufficiently, which is a different argument. But Dennis Kelly, letting Dennis Kelly go wasn't the wrong move. Uh, 2022 Julio Jones, good riddance, actually did worse in Tampa Bay. He had 24 catches there after 31 catches in Tennessee, but he did double his touchdown total for the Bucs. He had two for the Titans. He had one, uh, Janoris Jenkins left and, uh, played two games for the 49ers this year. So by my count, that list is 23 guys. Five of them, Zach Brown, Jack Conklin, Adoree Jackson, Ryan Suckup, and Roger Saffold played as well or better after they left here. Five of 23. So 22% did as well or better. Any of those guys get a huge raise? Conklin got a huge raise. But these other guys, Zach Brown didn't get big money. Adoree Jackson took a, a cut from what he would have made on the um, – on the uh, fifth year uh, option. Ryan Suckup, I'm sure, got less. Roger Saffold definitely got less. So the guys who left for big money, none of them did better. That means 78% hit rate for the Titans in terms of letting these guys walk. Um, so I think they've got a pretty good sense under Rob the Robinson variable regime. Robinson a little bit on his own at the beginning with Malarkey then with Vrabel, have made good calls on guys that they could survive without or replace. Um, and I think that's something that this organization's been pretty good at overall. Previously, some of it was, you know, really money forced and, and guys that you would have wanted to keep. You go back to the, the huge salary cap purge. Certainly you would have wanted to keep Derek Mason. You would have wanted to keep Samari Roll. But uh, these situations are not like those situations. And I don't think Titans are in any way going to be lamenting um, the moves they made today. I'll pay a little bit of a tribute to Taylor Lewan a bit later on. I'm Paul Kuharski from paulkuharski.com. I want to encourage you to join my site. You can see here if you're watching on YouTube, it's just $5.99 a month. If you're listening, I'm going to read that to you. Um, for that, you get everything that I write, columns from Mike Herndon, like the one this week on free agent edge rushers. Um, he and I both believe that with or without Bud Dupree, the Titans need to be looking there. Um, and there are some veterans who would fit in nicely and would not break the bank because top flight edge rushers do not get to free agency. And maybe you could take care of this in free agency and then take something off off the need to draft list. you got Harold Landry coming off of ACL. Autry, who's really an end, who could play some tackle, who's playing outside linebacker for you now. He's 33 with a year left on his contract. you got to be thinking of the, the future there. Uh, Weaver has upside but limits. Sam O, they like. This team has to have a great rush to succeed. They keep needing to feed that. I'm a fan of Arden Key, who I think played really well for the Jaguars against the Titans in two games this year. Uh, Rand Carthon has some experience with him from San Francisco. You need to be a member. Go read Mike's piece. He's uh, done edge rushers this week. Previously, he did free agents to be at wide receiver and on the offensive line. Uh, everything he writes, everything I write, everything Blake Bettingfield, uh, former scout for the Titans, writes during the season and pre-draft. Um, private Facebook page, 
chats uh, that are like this podcast, except me answering questions and interacting with you and that are for members only. Uh, all features that you get for um, what a, a fancy cocktail for less than a price of a fancy cocktail or a coffee. Um, members tell you it's a great value. So I hope you'll come join. This is kind of the front door to that and a sampling of uh, the kind of analysis that you will get. I joked at the start that I've been to uh, virtually every major city in America. I think Portland, Oregon might be uh, Portland, Oregon and Milwaukee are the two places I am missing. I never would have put Tulsa on the list, but uh, I'm on a Springsteen kick following this tour. Um, and so I went to Tulsa on Monday to go to a show on Tuesday night. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not going to hit you with more Springsteen stuff. I'm going to hit you with uh, my feelings about this, this city. I just watched, um, what is it, 1883? Uh, the Yellowstone prequel. So I had kind of this feeling for the prairie and all of that. Uh, it's a little different since, uh, since then, but this is a uh, even smaller city than I imagined. Um, and I really had a feeling um, I stayed downtown walkable to the arena and uh, walkable. I went to uh, a Jamaican restaurant by chance uh, just looked up, you know, some some good restaurant options. Um, and so kind of walked maybe three quarters of a mile over a bridge and through downtown there. And then the Woody Guthrie um, Center or museum was, was nearby there and uh, poked around a little bit. It felt a lot like Nashville felt to me in 1997 when I stayed at the Union Station Hotel, which was across the street then from the Tennesseans offices when I interviewed for um, the Oilers beat with the with the Tennessean. Uh, the weather was kind of the same it was overcast and breezy. I imagine it's breezy in Tulsa a lot. Um, but there was just kind of a, a little bit of a stark and small feel to it. And I don't feel like Tulsa is going to be on the upswing and look like uh, Nashville looks now, if you put it on the same timetable. Uh, I don't, I don't get the sense that growth is coming there. Uh, but I, I was really struck that in my time walking to that lunch and around a little bit to get a feel for the town and then walking to and from the arena that I saw only two homeless people. Uh, so that's a good thing going on in Tulsa. Uh, maybe it was just a coincidence that I didn't cross paths, but uh, here's to Tulsa for taking care of its homeless or not having many. Um, the other thing is Woody Guthrie Center or Museum. Um, I'm not a big Woody Guth Guthrie guy, but he's an important historical figure, and Springsteen's a big Guthrie guy. It's closed on Monday and Tuesday. I would think if Bruce Springsteen's playing a show in your town, you would know that Springsteen's a big Guthrie guy, especially since he got a private tour of the place on Monday, that you might change your schedule and take advantage of all the people that are coming to your town on Monday and Tuesday who would come through your turnstile to see your museum. You lost a ton of uh, advertising and ticket money and the like. It's not good foresight. Change up your schedule for one week. A whole bunch of out-of-towners were in who had time to kill Monday and Tuesday and probably would have come. I don't think that's very good planning. I don't think it's very good planning at all. On to Taylor Lewan. Uh, I wrote a piece uh, that is uh, free at paulkowarski.com. Uh, reminiscing about Taylor Lewan and some of my early interactions with him, one where he was very upset about a uh, picture I posted on Instagram about him uh, freeze frame off TV of him getting his ass kicked by Whitney Merciless in what was Ken Wisenhunt's last game as, uh, as coach of the team where uh, they gave up seven sacks of Zach Mettenberger who played for an injured Marcus Mariota. I'll never have another relationship with somebody on the roster, like the relationship I had, I had, and I have with, uh, with Taylor Luan. 
I was 45 when he was drafted and joined the team. And I don't know, somehow I was still young enough to connect in a way that I can't now. And also the environments changed in those nine years in a way that guys are, are in many cases, understandably much, much more guarded, a lot more sensitive to criticism. Um, he was tough enough to be able to take criticism and, and still want to connect um, in some way with a significant voice in the media. Um, he wanted to joke around and, uh, and you'll get a reaction from, from everybody. And uh, I got to know his fiance a little bit, which helped me connect with him because I, I, I was interested in what made him tick. One of the very first stories I wrote at this site was uh, about how he had changed and, and matured and what got to the heart of the matter and the spoiler that it was a girl. Um, and we could give each other a, a hard time with a text either, either way, you know, I, I might send him something about, um, you know, a bad player, bad game or, or uh, something he did or said at practice. And he might uh, send me something about a, a question I asked or a, a tweet or something like that. And we were both safe, felt safe with, uh, with that. And um, I don't know, how, uh, you know, you try to form those relationships, but I think it's a much tougher environment now to do so. And certainly uh, a harder relationship for a 54 uh, year old to form with, uh, with 20, 21, 22 year olds coming into the, to the locker room. Now, I wish I sincerely wish it had gone better for him um, over the last four years where injuries really, you know, kind of took him out of more than more than half of the games that he, he might have played in. I think it's 52 percent. Those numbers that I gave you a little earlier. Um, and look, it, it wasn't all good by any means. Got into it with the refs. Um you know, uh, taunted opponents, missed all these games with injuries, uh, you know, sometimes got carried away with the theatrics. Um, there was a lot going on there. But when he was at the top of his game, this guy was a damn, damn good left tackle. And it's too bad he didn't get to see that out longer with this team. So it could really pulled into the same lane as Brad Hopkins and Michael Roos. But uh, that's still a hell of a three-pack for the Titans to have had um, consecutively there. And, and I talked to him for a story I did on the three of those guys. And he was looking forward to doing his part to bring the next guy along and uh, the fourth guy. And so it's, it's uh, you know, bittersweet that he's not going to have the chance to do that for whoever that, uh, that next guy is. And um, I know that he surely – um, while he might be hoping for an outside chance to return, is also hoping that that left tackle position for uh, the only franchise he's known to this point, probably the only franchise he's going to know, winds up in good hands um, with somebody that's likely going to be drafted um, at the end of April who comes in and, and does a job like Hopkins did, like Roos did, and like Lawan himself did when he was at the top of his game. Um, a really valuable um, player for this franchise and somebody the likes of which we're not going to see in that locker room again. I don't think with the energy and the, uh, and the willingness to talk and have fun. It's just a much more serious guarded place now. And I think it's symbolic of the way the league has evolved and not all of it's good. Um, and in a, in a way that will um, muffle a Taylor Lewan type, it certainly isn't. But I hope I'm wrong, and I hope there is another one, and I hope uh, I hope we're telling him about what Lewan was like and that he's, uh, he's trying to match or surpass what Lewan did on the field when he was at his best and uh, in, in talking to all of us and becoming a beloved guy who's, uh, you know, drinking a beer out of a catfish at a Predators game and uh, and all of that stuff. So uh, appreciate you listening. Please subscribe, rate, and do all that fine stuff to the podcast. And um, 
if you're watching here on YouTube, please do the same. Had a good conversation um, on, on last week's episode um, on on YouTube. So uh, if, you, if you write some comments here, I will be sure to keep a lookout and to respond. And until I see you again, I'll ask you, please don't block the box, but do please, please lock your locks.